Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and also a special thanks to uh, Fkitem and uh, Alberto for inviting me here this morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I've chosen a topic of my talk, which is uh, something different from what I've presented before. I want to talk about using lasers in particle-based applications. From uh, Neda and Gata, we just heard about uh, one atom thick layers. I want to draw your attention a bit uh, in, in uh, bigger particles. So maybe we are thinking here, we, we're talking here about uh, millions or billions of atoms within a particle. Before starting, I want to give credit to my co-workers, Reza Gadiri, Mario Zubek, uh, um, Mario Shakiv, uh, Stefan Balchikowski, who is still in Laser Centrum Hannover, Cemal Esen, uh, Thomas Weigel, and myself, who were in charge of this work. Yeah, particles play an important role uh, in uh, our daily life. We see particles and interaction of uh, light with particles, not just in the rainbow, which we all know, but also in aerosols, in sprays, in uh, jet, jet trails, as you can see on the left-hand side, which are frozen particles. Uh, and uh, when they're illuminated by light, you see some interesting light effects. Also, very old uh, effects, especially from the nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticles have been used hundreds of years ago into these very nice, uh, in, in these very nice church windows, which are all different applications which uh, haven't been explored so far. So we see a huge range of applications for particles and especially for the interaction of light with particles of different sizes. So, the overview of my talk is I want to start with uh, some basic uh, uh, remarks on the light particle interaction processes, and then I would uh, especially focus on whispering gallery modes and optical tweezers. In the second part, I want to focus on uh, light scattering, uh, showing applications how we can use uh, fluorescence and elastic scattering for pollen characterization and uh, some uh, recent activities also in uh, uh, characterizing uh, levitated particles, for example, by Raman scattering. And finally, I want to show some uh, uh, examples for laser-generated nanoparticles and their analysis. So when we have a closer look to the light-particle interaction, we illuminate some uh, particles just by light of a wavelength lambda. And uh, we see, of course, uh, elastic light scattering, and uh, we see some inelastic light scattering where the wavelength changes. And uh, in the particle itself, we have some direct light particle interaction, which can be whispering gallery modes, and optical tweezers are used uh, in this direction. For elastic scattering, uh, we see a very sensitive uh, behavior regarding the shape of the particle, so we can use this. Uh, effect for particle characterization, for particle recognition, whereas inelastic light scattering can be used for uh, chemical composition uh, analyzing and also for detecting the shape of a particle, and here we're talking especially about Raman and fluorescence. Uh, Neda and Geta also mentioned Lord Valley, and I have uh, great respect for uh, all his work, and uh, one of his work was also related to uh, analyzing the whispering gallery modes. And he was the first, uh, really, to experience these whispering gallery modes by uh, acoustic waves. And he went up to St. Paul's Cathedral. Maybe you have been there before, in this very nice church. And if you go up to the gallery, you will find that uh, if you whisper, that uh, there will be uh, propagating waves where from every point of this gallery, you will hear the whispering, the acoustic waves, which propagate all around this uh, uh, gallery. So transferring this uh, concept to optics, we see rays circulating in phase. Uh, yeah, uh, we, see, we observe uh, uh, constructive interference and some resonance behavior, of course. So spherical particles in this direction are quite uh, nice because they have a perfect symmetry in all these three dimensions. And theoretically, people have observed high quality factors of these resonators up to 10 by the power of 9, 
which is theoretically possible, but you have to think about how you can um, how you can transfer your light into the particles. Therefore, you need some interface. And realistically, Q factors up to 10 by the power of 5 or 10 by the power of 6, which is still quite high, are possible. So in general, we have to subdivide into uh, two categories. First, the small reflection angle, which you can see here. This means, of course, you have a higher, reflect, higher reflection losses. However, this is sensitive to radial changes in the uh, um, refractive index of the particle. Th those rays have a shorter way per round trip. They are less sensitive uh, to the changes of the size. Here we see broad resonances and a rather small Q factor. The other um, alternative is large reflection angles, and this means we have uh, sensitivity towards changes not just of the refractive index of the particle, but also regarding the refractive index of the surrounding, which can be air or uh, some other uh, environmental media. Uh, these rays are also very sensitive to changes of the size of the particles, and here we observe very high quality factors. And as an example for those whispering gallery modes, here uh, we see um, uh, an off-resonance uh, behavior compared to a resonant behavior. The uh, size parameter of the particles is on the left-hand side 38 and on the right-hand side almost 38, so it's comparable. However, we see if you look carefully to the... Oops, we have a pointer here. If you look carefully to the intensity, which is uh, shown here, we see it's a factor of 10,000 in between. So the resonance position depends on, of course, the diameter of the particle, the refractive index of the particle and the surrounding, and of the wavelengths which you use for illumination. So if the diameter changes, or if the particle's refractive index changes, or the surrounding refractive index changes, for example, with temperature, we can uh, build up a temperature sensor. If the refractive index of the surrounding changes, we can build up a concentration measurement device. If the wavelength changes, we can build up a wavelength sensing device. And uh, if we think about very high quality factors, we can also build a laser resonators from these particles. So how do we get our light into the particles? And one easy way is to use a prism coupler. This is quite easy to handle. It's mainly based on ev evanescent field coupling. Here we have low losses and very high quality factors. I mentioned up to 6 by the power of 5. Other groups around the world use other concepts for coupling. For example, um, tapered waveguides or tapered fibers can also be used although based on evanescent field coupling in this case. So one example I want to show you is a, a microspectrometer, which we realized using wavelength sensing. Principle is shown here. We use, in this case, 16 particles. It's a 4 times 4 array. And the coupling of the light is... A, uh, through evanescent field coupling and this prism coupler here. We have a tunable diode laser here uh, with a polarization maintaining fiber. We have a wave meter up here and we observe the resonance of these particles just with a simple camera. So then we tune our tunable laser uh, over a certain wavelength range and we observe for each wavelength uh, oops, how the particle, whether the particle is in resonance or off resonance. And this can be seen here. This is just one particle, which is uh, this particle here, and there are up to 15,000 frames over the whole wavelength range shown here. And this can be mapped for all uh, the uh, particles and for all wavelengths, and we come up with a database here. And then if we have some unknown wavelengths, we can just look up into our database 
And uh, if we've calibrated it before just by a conventional wave meter, we can really approximate our wavelengths with a very high accuracy below, two point, uh, below 0.2 picometer, which is about 20 ppm in our case for 10 nanometer wavelength range. So we just need um, 16 slightly different particles, and we just need some uh, photodiodes, and then we can build up a very tiny microspectrometer. Another application of this concept might be to use uh, these particles, these resonances for temperature measurement. As mentioned before, the diameter of the particle is depending on the temperature, and if temperature changes, we can uh, change also the resonances. And this is shown here. We use a hollow fiber, and the particle here is uh, just put in front of the hollow fiber, and the evanescent field is guided here through the uh, cladding of the fiber into the particle, and then we can observe whether we, have res whether we have resonance or whether we are off resonance. This can easy be easily be done here just with a photodiode and a computer, and if we look carefully with, uh, to the signal, we see that the signal, the resonances, they shift and uh, then we just can do autocorrelation, and we find that uh, temperature shift is shown here, and the wavelength shift is up here. So we can just look up our wavelength shift by autocorrelation, and then we can define the temperature without any additional electrical current. Third application which we can uh, also realize is a biochemical sensor based of, based of particle, which we use for concentration measurement. So if we change the surrounding, the refractive index of the surrounding, for example, by putting in glucose into water or by using ascorbic acids, then we can also shift the resonances of the particle. And again, we can calibrate the system and we can come up with very precise measurement of the concentrations depending on the refractive index. Next, I want to show you some applications regarding uh, optical tweezers where we are working uh, with, especially in uh, micro-manufacturing. Most of you know optical tweezers. Here we have uh, a particle, and we see some uh, reflection and refraction in the particle. This means a change of the momentum flow of the photons, and uh, as a reaction, the particle uh, uh, is uh, forced to be moved into one direction. And uh, this has to be done in two, direct, in two dimensions, of course. In one dimension, we, obs we observe a scattering force. And in the other direction, we use a um, radial uh, force. And this forces the uh, particle to move into the focal position here. And if we have tight focusing, we have an optical trap, which we can use for trapping particles. We work with multiple traps, so the main principle can be either time sharing just by using scanners uh, with the benefit to use uh, full power at each trap. However, when we want to make 3D trapping, we have to find different uh, alternatives, and one can be to use um, spatial light modulators or micromirror devices. Uh, here we can um, use all traps at the same time. This is a quite simple setup. The laser system, the beam expander, and the spatial light modulator, and then some focusing optics. We, for manufacturing purposes, we coat our particles with uh, two biomolecule coatings. One is streptavidine, the other is biotin. And uh, those biomolecules have the advantage, if you bring them in close proximity, they will almost have a covalent bonding, and so we can build up structures just by putting particle by particle next to each other, as shown here. And here's a uh, uh, short movie about how this can work. So we take just a streptavidin coated particle, and a biotin coated particle is the small one here, and then we can bring them together, we can rotate them in all three dimensions, 
And then we can uh, try to find the next coated particle, bring it to the original place, and take some time here to join it together with the original structure. Just this particle takes some time in the movie. And principally, we can really set up complete three-dimensional devices uh, by using this technique, uh, for example, for tissue engineering, where we can uh, uh, realize such uh, scaffold structures or for metamaterials, for example, which we have heard before. Uh, all these different applications are possible because we can, of course, use different particles with different sizes and uh, allow us to tailor the geometry. There are many applications you find in literature, of course, for particle, uh, uh, for, for optical tweezers to detect or to measure forces. For example, here, uh, the force of actine uh, 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 molecules or of my myosin molecules on actine uh, is uh, measured or here a uh, uh, vesicle, uh, artificial vesicle has been used covered with actine fibers and uh, then one particle is uh, bonded here on this uh, uh, part of the vesicle and another one is uh, bonded on the opposite side and then you can measure she shear stresses or tensile stresses for example. Following with uh, light scattering um, of course, light scattering is a well-known technique since many, many years. Uh, elastic light scattering is uh, quite easy. Compared to Raman or to fluorescence, we can observe a very high signal level here. It's a coherent process, so we have interference effect, which has been uh, demonstrated nicely here by Gustav Mee about 100 years ago in, in his theory. We have diffraction effects. Uh, and we can observe, depending on the size parameter here, quite um, complex scattering patterns. Inelastic scattering by fluorescence or by Raman is usually incoherent, so here we have a very smooth angle dependence. Now, uh, it's material specific, especially for Raman. We have the Raman shift. For Raman, because it's an, uh, um, it's an, uh, Direct process, we have a polarized, uh, we have polarizing effects, whereas for fluorescence we use, uh, we lose polarization, and compared to direct scattering for elastic or elastic scattering, here we have a relatively weak signal. One application I would show you is the recognition of pollen by fluorescence and also by elastic light scattering, and this is the fluorescence picture for different types of pollen. Elm pollen, sphere pollen, and uh, some simulation. Simulation was just a polymer uh, particle we used and compare it with uh, other, other types of pollen. And this is the scattering angle from uh, 0 to 180 degree. Of course, this is symmetric, therefore we only have one half sphere here. And the intensity, and we, we see a complete different behavior, of course, compared to the elastic light scattering, which we've seen before. This uh, is the setup we used. So we use a goniometer here, and then we just rotate the laser beam uh, uh, compared to the uh, photodiode, and we were able to measure 180 degree just by the setup. This was the setup we used for elastic light scattering. Uh, here we used a green laser, and uh, we illuminated the pollen just from the backside of this half-sphere mirror here, and then we were able to get a picture from a half-sphere completely in one measurement. And this shows the picture. Uh, this is a sideboard hemisphere for different type of pollen. You see this is an SEM picture of this kind of pollen, and this is another kind of pollen. Both looks quite different, obviously, and if you look at the scattering, the elastic light scattering picture, they also look quite different. So we can use just pattern recognition software in order to classify pollen, and this was uh, shown here with many different pollen types. 
birch pollen, chestnut, hazel, and so on. And it shows that for some kind of pollen, elastic light scattering can easily be used to measure or to recognize really up to 100% of uh, these kind of pollen, whereas other types of pollen can only be recognized by more than 60%, which is still quite high uh, ratio. Next, we did some work with uh, acoustic, acoustically levitated particles. So we used an acoustic levitator here, which we designed by ourselves in order to uh, achieve standing waves, waves of acoustic waves. And within these nodes of uh, uh, these acoustic waves, we can uh, um, trap the particles. This is more or less acoustic trapping. And then we can do, for example, Raman scattering or Raman measurement on these uh, particles without the influence of the underground of the substrate, of course. And uh, this is quite a simple setup again. And uh, on the right-hand side, it's hard to see, but I will explain briefly. You have, uh, I think, one of these substances. I cannot read exactly what it was. Um, the, the red curve shows the original um, Raman spectrum in a glass vessel and uh, the blue spectrum, which is much better and which shows much better peaks, is the acoustically levitated particle in the uh, trap without the influence of any vessel or of the substrate. So the signal is much better and gives much better um, information here compared to conventional Raman microscopy. Finally, I want to uh, show some examples for nanoparticle generation. So we go from the microparticles, the particles I've shown before were in the range of about 100 micrometer, now to the nanometer particles. And uh, we use laser ablation using femtosecond laser in this case to ablate gold for example, in a water solution or silver or titanium or copper, and you see the plasmon resonances of gold. It's a red color. It gives red color. Silver gives about a bit yellow color. Titanium, gray color, and copper, more or less brown color. Yeah, this is... Uh, uh, shows also that these particles are quite stable in uh, their solution. So here's a high concentration, which is uh, obviously because the silver is very bright, also titanium, quite blue. So where can we use these uh, stabilized particles? For example, we can use electrophoretic coating of implants, and this is... Uh, nickel titanium, which is a biocompatible material, which we just used for coating of stands, which are laser cut and afterwards coated with these nickel titanium nanoparticles. And the behavior of these medical implants was much improved regarding cell adhesion and uh, cell proliferation compared to the naked uh, implant without particle coating. Laser radiation, especially uh, femtosecond and picosecond laser uh, um, radiation can also be used for fragmentation of microparticles into nanoparticles within a free liquid jet, which is shown here. So this can be just on the fly by inducing shock waves and high temperature fields you can destroy your microparticles into fragments of nanoparticles in the size range below 100 nanometer. Where can this be used for? For example, for some uh, medical applications. Here's a, a pharmaceutic model substance, alizarin, uh, which has some uh, molecular change, which is shown here. And this molecular uh, this molecule can be used to um, intercalate DNA. And if used in uh, tumors, the cells 
cannot, or the DNA cannot replicate anymore by itself, and the tumor growth can be stopped, and therefore it's a quite an uh, important substance. And the question is, how can this be stabilized? And it can be well done with an, uh, laser fragmented nanoparticles, and this only shows 45 minute uh, stabilization, but in fact, we observed many longer times, up to a few days, stabilized uh, in water or in different water solutions. So how do we measure particles and particle sizes? Uh, there are many um, applications in literature. And one of uh, the mostly used application is uh, dynamic light scattering. So there's a laser light illuminated into the nanoparticle solution. And then we can just observe the motion, the Brownian motion of the particles, and follow the trajectories. And the trajectories and the motion of the particle is not just depending on the viscosity of the material, but also, of course, on the diameter of the, um, or the radius of the particle. And this can be observed by autocorrelation again, and we can come up with a, such kind of nice size distribution curve. And you see there are most of the particles in the range of below 100 nanometer in this case. Using uh, metallic nanoparticles, we were able to uh, generate those particles with a charge on, on the surface. and. Maybe we can uh, start the, the movies up here. You see, when we apply no voltage to the solution, can you start the movie? This one and this one? The, uh, if, if you apply no voltage, the particles are stable, so they don't move, whereas uh, if you apply a voltage of 20 volt DC, we see that they move around, and this is an indication, of course, that they are charged on the surface, and this can also be used uh, uh, for in situ functionalization of those particles, but in principle, it's also the uh, basis for stabilization because uh, they repel each other when they are charged with the same, with the same uh, charge. So in summary, particles in combination with laser light still offer a very bright portfolio of applications, and I've shown you only one, only very few applications for whispering gallery modes, for scattering, and also for nanoparticle generation. The particle sizes we use are in the range between several tens of nanometer up to hundreds of micrometer, and the effects I explained strongly depend, of course, on the type of the material, of the size, and also the geometry. And the field, to my opinion, is still largely unexplored. More applications in this direction will potentially arise within the next couple of years. Thank you very much for staying and for listening to my presentation.